Since antiquity, the bearing of children has been a matter of great societal importance. From pharaohs to kings, bringing an heir and continuing a lineage has placed huge pressure on society's women. But what of the matter of fertility, conception, and all the complexities that come along with it? In ancient society right up to the modern era, infertility has been a matter steeped in religious and cultural fears, and has predominantly placed the blame on women. Much of this was born of antiquity's lack of medical and scientific understanding. Some of this was based on ancient society's prevalence of religion and pleasing the gods. Yet a lot of this was simply the placement of women in society and a total lack of understanding of the female body. As a result, infertile women and those in unions unable to bear children faced some grim outcomes in ancient times and beyond. Come with us today as we explore the chilling outcomes of women deemed infertile in ancient times. Welcome to History on Fleek. Infertility has been an avenue of stigma and blame across the annals of time. Since antiquity, the causes and roots of infertility have been particularly blamed on women. The stigma has been multifold and differing per epoch and society. For instance, medieval Japan's public would regard any infertile noblewoman with contempt. Women without children in the 1500s England faced considerable societal disdain as femininity was largely defined by motherhood. Later in time, infertility would receive a more undercurrent stigma by association. 1800s France would show some of the first institutional stigmatizing of infertility in women, with it being linked to promiscuity, venereal disease, and abortion. Yet in ancient times, the stigma was less societal and more astral. Many ancient texts detail stories of childlessness and miraculous births, from Abrahamic texts to Icelandic epics. Yet throughout antiquity, the belief was that infertility was a curse from the gods, a curse that solely landed on women. It wouldn't be till about the 1800s that matters like fertilization and reproduction had a grounded understanding. The indigenous tribes of Australia in antiquity believed that pregnancy was a result of a woman's diet and not sexual intercourse. Ancient Rome showed a remarkable penchant for persecuting women for infertility. During feasts celebrating the god of Mars, infertile women would have their bellies whipped with goat skin whips, thinking it would cure them of their barren condition. Curiously, ancient Egypt would actually produce some texts considering infertility as a medical matter, but these sadly didn't stick. Medical Misunderstanding – Terrifying Treatments A limited understanding of the medical realm ultimately left women's health in a precarious place. Ancient tribes, such as Trobriand Islanders, understood pregnancy as brought on by the breaking of the hymen, with intercourse only a matter of pleasure. This meant any infertility, deformity, or difficulties were viewed as a matter exclusive to the woman in question and her body. Ironically and needless to say, this female-centric view of infertility left any potential issue with the male partner left unexamined as well. In this time and world, committing behaviors perceived as sins or not attending religious ceremonies were likely to be seen as the cause of infertility. So how did a world with no understanding of complex medical matters and a profound fear of the gods do in response to infertility? They came up with, in majority, pretty dangerous treatments. While the medieval period would see people going on pilgrimages and using prayer to address childlessness, it would also see people drinking bizarre remedies full of animal sexual organs to address their own organs' perceived lack of vitality. However, ancient times were far more regressive. Today's infertility treatment regards in vitro clinics. Ancient Roman Greece had oracles who would advise fumigation of the womb. That's right literally blowing smoke inside a person. Now, that couldn't possibly go wrong, could it? Hippocrates, one of antiquity's most famed figures in medical history, had some rather curious approaches to infertility. By Hippocrates' reckoning, if a woman drank breast milk and plant butter then vomited it, she would conceive. Another Hippocrates special was grinding up lead and stone till it was a paste and placing it in a rag. The rag was then to be dipped in breast milk and placed inside the woman's delicates. Oh gosh, guys. Then again, if you think this is extreme, the Aztecs would sacrifice a virgin to the goddess Xochicatzel. The virgin would have her skin removed so a priest could wear it for a following ceremony. Other grim antiquity and fertility treatments include the advice of Roman scholar Pliny the Elder. In one of his many writings, Pliny declared drinking a eunuch's urine was a surefire cure for infertility. This was believed to counteract any negative infertility spells. As you can see, across ancient times, there was a crossover and entwining of religious and cultural beliefs and medical approaches. Religious, cultural, social repercussions 
in a realm of medical understanding being bare minimum and ultimately tied to religious and cultural beliefs, there would be implications for women. Ancient Egyptian papyrus reveals humiliating public rituals to test for a woman's fertility. These included being made to sit on beer-soaked earth and being forced to eat a copious amount of dates to see if the woman vomited. No, that isn't a comedy sketch, that's a fertility test from ancient times. Women without children in ancient India were also subject to a perspective placing them as spiritually abandoned and godless. In the Vedic texts, women who could not conceive were perceived as possessed by the goddess Nirti and liable to be cast out of the family unit. Ancient China was maybe one of the only societies from antiquity that found a workaround for a woman's infertility, drafting another woman, typically in the form of a concubine. Ancient Rome and Greece were no less spurious in their shunning treatment of infertile women. In these cultures, a struggle with fertility did not garner women respect or support. In ancient Rome, should a couple be struggling to produce children, the husband had legitimate grounds for divorce. Again, placing blame on women at the time was a common theme of ancient Greek attitudes. Founder of the Hippocratic Oath, Hippocrates himself, blamed overweight women for compressing the mouth of the womb and hypothesized a horrifying premise called menstrual retention. Make of that what you will. Beyond ancient times, the arrival of the medieval period and the following Middle Ages didn't hold much better outcomes for women unable to bear children. Medieval Europe was convinced infertile women were either cursed by the devil or witches, or simply witches themselves. Following this, they would usually be burnt at the stake. How this was supposed to bear a child is anyone's guess. Curiously, the Middle Ages held the first instances of men's fertility being a factor in whether a child could be produced or not. This being said, infertility was still viewed as a curse from God and a fundamental stain on any marriage. Arguably, the most famous cultural image of the struggle with infertility of the era was Henry VIII's wife-slaying onslaught in a desperate search for a son and heir. Shapeshifting for survival and safety Across societies from antiquity up to the modern era, women who were unable to bear children were often forced to adapt to find a viable place. Infertile women may have found themselves taking up the role of healer in medieval times and beforehand, as well as midwives into the Middle Ages. Many other women finding themselves unable to bear children in societies that define femininity and vitality in the bearing of children may have taken up religious duties, joining denominations to provide themselves roles and cover for their perceived lacking. In ancient Rome, should a woman of an elite family no longer bear children and face divorce from her husband, the children previously born would stay with their father. The costs of infertility could be huge. Frequently from the Common Era, societies showed a prevalence for polygamy, Egyptian marriage contracts outlining a wife's infertility as a potential clause. Child care and midwife roles could be taken by many women unable to bear children for an appropriate role in a society deeming them unfit. Incredibly, today in Egypt, childless peasant women can be found circling the statues of Ramses II in the hope of bringing themselves children in the future. Despite centuries passing since ancient Egyptian customs, the desperation to avoid a historically condemned status leaves them turning to the oldest customs and desire for magic. It would be the Renaissance that made real strides in scientific progress on the concept and thinking of infertility. It would be 1677 when von Liebenhoek identified sperm under the microscope for the first time in scientific history, and 1752 when the first experiments were made on the fertilization process. It would take more than another century before fertilization was marked as a cooperative biological process, the union of sperm and egg. Infertility was increasingly understood as a two-way street that befell either sex. That's not to say it was smooth sailing. Female infertility was still believed to be psychosomatic into the mid-20th century. Even more curiously, adoption was advised as a means to increase a woman's chance of conceiving. Yet, come the late 20th century, the first test tube baby was born in 1978 in England, with an in vitro sister born some three years later. Today, infertility is seen for what it is, a fact of life caused by a variety of complex to simple matters, befalling both sexes. Infertility and its treatment are available today for all, and for the most part, it's no longer a taboo, leaving people shamed or in the dark or out of society. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.